like to ask you to bow your heads with me as uh, we pray and ask for the Lord's uh, presence here today. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for giving us this opportunity, Lord, to open your word and to see what you have to share with us this evening. Father, please speak to our hearts. We know that angels are here, Lord, both good and evil. Lord, may our hearts and our minds be in tune for what you will say. And then, Lord, may, may this message, may this truth be echoed all throughout Australia. Uh, from this uh, small and humble beginning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like for you to open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4. We are uh, living in a world where people are stressed, um, people are worried, people are scared, uh, terrified, if you will, uh, for their future. This world is going through financial stress, political stress, all kinds of stress. Uh, this disaster that's happening here in Australia now is just a snapshot of uh, disasters happening all over the world, and people are really looking for hope. People are looking, I believe, for rest. How many of you would agree with that? Uh, <clears throat> I want you to notice with me Hebrews 4 and verse 9. Hebrews 4 and verse 9. The Bible tells us here, There remaineth therefore a, what everyone? Rest to the people of God. Praise God that there is rest for the people of God. Amen? The Bible tells us there remaineth a rest to the people of God. Uh, this term, rest, is a very significant term. The Greek word is the word sabbatismos. Sabbatismos. And I've really come to love that word. Uh, it has opened up uh, some incredible things in my study of the great controversy. I want to share some of those things with you this evening. I want you to understand that God here is telling his people that there is a rest that remains. In other words, there is a rest that is yet future for the people of God. And in order to understand this, you would also have to understand that uh, when God had uh, delivered or was delivering the children of Israel out of Egypt, he promised them a land of what? Of rest. A land of rest. It was a promised land. And so what God is telling us here is that just as uh, the Israelites were led out of Egypt into a land of rest, so there remains a rest for the people of God. Therefore, what is that rest that remains for the people of God? Any ideas, any thoughts? It is... It is the land, the heavenly promised land, the heavenly kingdom. That is the rest that remains for the people of God. Amen? How many of you are looking forward to entering into that rest? Amen. 
And I want you to understand again that this word rest, the, the Greek of it is sabbatismos. God therefore is calling heaven his rest or his what? Sabbatismos. And I thought to myself, this is totally mind-blowing that God would call heaven his sabbatismos. That's a powerful thought. Why does God call heaven his sabbatismos? And in order to understand this, we are going to, we're going to go back into the Old Testament and look at some verses. I want you to notice with me Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26. And you'll notice with me verses 33 to 35. God here, speaking to the children of Israel, tells them, he is basically warning them, listen, if you enter into Canaan and begin to disobey me, this is what will happen. Verse 33, I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her, what everyone? Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate and you be in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when, ye de when you dwelt upon it. So, a land being at rest simply signified that the people in it were not rebelling against God. Does that make sense? If, if here the verses tell us that if the people were living against the will of God in that land, then the land was not enjoying her rest and God would move them out of that land so that the land could once again enjoy her Sabbath or enjoy her rest. How many of you following me? Okay. So, I want you to notice again with me, 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 6. Another verse that will help us to understand what it means for a land to be at rest. 2 Chronicles chapter 14 and verse 6. The Bible says here, Also, he built fenced cities in Judah, for the land had what? Had rest. And he had no, what everyone? War in those days because the Lord God had given him rest. From this verse, we see that a land being at rest also meant that the land was not at what? Not at war. So let's recap those two things. Number one, a land being at rest means the inhabitants of that land were not rebelling against God, number two, a land being at rest, also signified that there was no what? War in that land. And we're going to go ahead and look at one more verse here. Second Chronicles, chapter 36, verse 21. Second Chronicles, chapter 36. Verse 21, the Bible says here, speaking of the 70 years of captivity for the children of Israel to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. Remember, the children of Israel were put out of their promised land because they were what? rebelling against God. And so what we're learning here is that when a land was at rest, it simply meant that the land, the inhabitants of that land were at peace with God. There was no war, no conflict, and no rebellion against God. Therefore, we can begin to see why heaven would be called God's sabbatismos. Why? Because in heaven, there is no what? 
rebellion against God, and there is no war. It is a land of peace. And again, I would ask how many of you are looking forward into entering into that sabbatismos of God? Amen. Well, we've got to learn something here that uh, basically the sabbatismos represents three things. Harmony with God. Can you repeat that with me? Harmony with God. Number two, allegiance with God. What, everyone? Allegiance with God. And number three, to be rested in submission to God. Okay? Rested in submission to God. This is why heaven is called God's sabbatismos. Now, not only is heaven God's sabbatismos now and in the future to come, but heaven was also God's sabbatismos in the past. Are you following me so far? Listen. In the past, heaven was a place where there was no war, no sin, and no rebellion until an angel named Lucifer decided to rebel against God. Therefore, Lucifer broke something in heaven. What did he break? He broke the sabbatismos. Are you following me? <laughs> he broke the state of peace in which heaven had dwelt for who knows how long. Lucifer brought about a state of what? Okay. If I use the word rebellion, I want you to give me another word here. Um, Discord, okay, give me another word. Sin, another word. Unrest. <laughs> Rebellion is good, but unrest, that's the word I was looking for. The devil brought about a state of unrest. When I mention the word unrest, what do you think of? You think of war, you think of civil unrest, you think of political unrest, you think of social unrest, you think of religious unrest. Lucifer, by his rebellion in heaven, had, break, had broken the state of peace in heaven, right? And therefore brought about a state of unrest. So in case you haven't gotten the point yet, Lucifer broke the Sabbath. I hope you guys are just really, like, really just thinking hard <laughs> and not just going like this, okay? Broke the Sabbath? <laughs> Lucifer broke the Sabbath in heaven, and in breaking the Sabbath, all we're simply saying is that Lucifer was against the very foundation of God's government, which is rest. You see, that was the foundation of God's government. Angels simply rested in the will of God. But Lucifer said, wait a minute, I am no longer going to rest in the will of God. And in his refusal to rest in the will of God, he was warring against the very principle, the very foundation of God's government, and therefore warring against sabbatismos. So if I were to ask you, what was the great controversy in heaven over, what would be your response? It would be over the principle of rest. Sabbatismos. I don't need to rest in God. That was Lucifer's argument. The angel's argument was, no, we need to rest in God. What does it mean to rest in God? If God says do something, what do you do? You rest. Right? You don't resist, you rest. 
God says A, God says jump, you rest in that. And this is what heaven was based upon. God commanded, it was done. The angels rested and Lucifer began to say, wait a minute, we don't need to rest in God, we don't need to do what God says. The argument was over the issue of rest. And so, controversy broke out in heaven. And I thought that this was really interesting. I mean, um, we say that very often, controversy broke out in heaven, controversy broke out in heaven. And uh, sometimes we don't understand what we're actually saying. So I want you to um, uh, um, think of this with me. Um, God created the heaven and the earth uh, by doing what? By speaking, speaking the word. And I was sharing this in my workshop earlier. Do you know that the word universe means single sentence or single verse? Do you know that? Uni, single, verse, sentence or stanza. So if you want to know how the universe came to be, <laughs> you see that? God spoke. Now the question is, who was the word? Or who was the verse that was spoken? It was Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is the divine verse of God. Amen? Amen. And so uh, the devil uh, hated the verse of God. He hated Jesus. He hated the word of God. And the way I like to put it is that the devil was anti-verse or contra. <laughs> the devil was controverse. <clears throat> the great controversy, therefore, is simply against the verse or the word of God. Satan does not want us to rest in the verse of God. Does this make sense? The devil doesn't want us to be obedient to the verse or to the will of God. <clears throat> but there's something else. The devil, we, we understand, the devil was controverse, but there's something else that's interesting because, you know, the Bible says that Lucifer <clears throat> walked up and down in the midst of what? The stones of fire. What were those stones of fire? Okay, let me, let me, let me try to jog your mind a little bit. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, we're told here, Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 2. I want you to listen to this. Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 2. The Bible tells us here, we'll look at verse 3. This is speaking about God. No, we'll look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from, from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with 10,000 of saints. From his hand went a fiery law for them. What was this fiery, fiery law written on? Tables of stone. So could it be possible that the stones of fire upon which Lucifer walked up and down in the midst of heaven, could it be possible that those stones of fire are actually a reference to the law of God? Lucifer walking up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Why would God call these the stones of fire? Can anyone tell me what fire represents in the scripture? Purification, God's presence. Uh, Hebrews uh, 12, I believe it's verse 29, says our God is a consuming what? 
Fire? Why is he a consuming fire? Is he trying to scare us? I'm a consuming fire. You better watch out. No. The Song of Solomon tells us that love is like a vehement fire. God manifests himself as fire because he is love. So the stones of fire, if they are to point us to the law of God, Lucifer walking up and down in the, um, in the law of God, we know that this law is a law of what? Of love. This law was summed up, by the way, where the tick, think about this with me. Do you think that the Ten Commandments were in heaven? Do you think there was a commandment that said, Thou shalt not commit adultery in heaven? <laughs> no. No. The law in heaven was really summed up in one word. It was love. The angels did not. What I, the Ten Commandments is what I call today righteousness for dummies. You know, God had to spell out for us what love looked like. But in heaven, all there was was love. And, and love was simply manifested by what? Rest. If you love me, or we might say, if you love me, rest. So Lucifer begins to rebel against this concept of rest because rest is the entire symbol. Rest is the entire foundation of God's government. Rest, it's that simple. Rest. Lucifer rose up in rebellion and became contraverse, contra Christ, but also contra law. You understand? So, guess what happens to Lucifer? He got kicked out. <laughs> Do you remember what we just read? God told the children of Israel, if you sin in my sabbatismos, I will remove you from the land so that the land can once again enjoy her rest. So Lucifer is moved out of heaven, he and his angels, and heaven is once again restored as God's what? Sabbatismos. I ask this question very often. How is it that Lucifer was able to deceive one-third of holy and intelligent angels? Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever thought, how is it that he did it? And I, you know, I simply ask the question, do you think that if Lucifer said to the angels, hey guys, I want to be evil, who wants to come with me? <laughs> that the angels would have been like, hmm, uh, okay, no. Wouldn't have happened. The Bible says that these angels were deceived. Okay? How did Lucifer deceive one third of angels? By this. In Isaiah 14, Lucifer said, I will be like the Most High. If someone were to come up to you today and ask you, What is the Most High like? Some of the first things that would come out of your mouth would be what? He is loving, he is kind, he is merciful, he is long-suffering. So listen to what Lucifer was arguing then. Lucifer's argument was, I can be loving, kind, merciful, long-suffering, righteous, without God telling me how to do it. Are you following me? If we were to sum it up in one term, we would call that self-righteousness. 
So Lucifer's argument wasn't, let's go be evil. His argument was simply, hey, there are other ways to be righteous than what God has said. God, who are you to tell us how to be righteous? We're already really holy. <clears throat> remember Korah's rebellion? Yeah, any of you remember that? Where Korah rose up against Moses and said, why are you exalting yourself above the people? Don't you see that all the people are holy? That rebellion was a snapshot of what took place in heaven. Lucifer began to tell the angels, you don't need to rest in what God has said. You can do your own thing and be holy. We are already holy. Holiness has been, we, we are naturally holy. And so you can begin to see how angels uh, uh, could be deceived because the argument was one that simply said, isn't there other, you know, can't there be other ways to righteousness? That was Lucifer's original argument. It's not his argument anymore. He's just straight out evil. But originally, we're even told, Ellen White says, Lucifer did not at first know whither he was drifting. Anybody ever read that quote? He didn't know at first. He was self-deceived into thinking that he could sanctify himself. So Lucifer's argument was what? Self-sanctification. Self-sanctification. I can be righteous by myself. I want you to notice again in Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. And uh, you will notice Isaiah chapter 14. Notice with me verse 13. Lucifer speaking, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon where? The mount of the congregation. What does that sound like to you? The mount of the con When I say the word congregation, what do you think of? A church. So did you realize there was a church in heaven? Anybody? Yeah, there was a church of angels in heaven. You know, what do you do at church? You worship God. That's what was going on in heaven. There was the mount of the congregation. And what happened to this congregation? It split. Over what? Over the sabbatismos. Listen to me. The first church split took place over the principle of rest. Let me uh, share something else with you about this verse. The term Mount of the Congregation is the Hebrew term Har Mohad. It is the same term that is used in the book of Revelation, but translated in the Greek as Armageddon. <laughs> the word Armageddon, Har Mohad, or Megad in the Greek, same thing. Mount of the congregation, that's what Revelation um, uh, 16 is speaking about, Armageddon. And in Isaiah 14, Mount of the congregation. So listen to me then. There was a Har Magad or an Armageddon where? In heaven. in heaven. Mount of the congregation. And what split the Mount of the, con the Har Magad? What split it? It was the Sabbatismos. So then could it be that the Armageddon to come in the last days will once again focus over the issue of Sabbath? 
You see, beloved, what we're, what we're beginning to understand here is that the Sabbath goes much deeper than we have thought. There are principles in there that take us much deeper. And I believe that when we begin to share these principles with our non-Adventist uh, friends, they will begin to see the Sabbath in its true bearing. And then our preaching of the Sabbath will go like wildfire. That's the kind of fire I would like to see burning up Australia. So, Lucifer is cast out because there was a battle of Armageddon. In heaven. He is now cast out and, and, and heaven is once again at peace. And now God is about to create planet earth. And I want you to notice something with me. Genesis chapter 1 verse 4. Genesis chapter 1 verse 4. The Bible tells us here. Genesis chapter 1 verse 4. God saw the light that it was good and God divided the, the light from the darkness. That's the end of day 1. God saw that it was what, everyone? Good. Verse 10, and God called the dry land earth, the gathering together of this water is called he sees, and God saw that it was good. Uh, verse 12, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after its kind and tree yielding fruit at whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was Good. And as you go down all the days, you find that God says it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. What he was saying was it's all in harmony. Everything is settled. Everything is at peace. In fact, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, go there with me. Genesis 2, verse 15, the Bible says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and... To what? To keep it. Everything was at peace with God. And the Bible says that God put man in the garden to do two things. What? Dress it and to keep it. Now we can begin to understand why in Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 through 3... God Sabbath. Let me read it for you, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made and rested, or the Hebrew word is Sabbath. So God did what, everyone? Sabbath on the seventh day from all his work which he had made and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Why was God resting? Because everything was at what? Peace in him. Therefore when God gave man the Sabbath what he was giving him was the sign of allegiance. <laughs> okay, I tried some other way. What he was giving him was the symbol that earth was under submission to the will of God in heaven. I am Sabbathing to let you know that everything is at peace in me. All is good. I am giving you, in, in giving you the Sabbath, I am giving you the entire philosophy of my government summed up in one day. So now we can begin to understand why the devil hates the Sabbath so much, it's not just because the Sabbath is a day, it's because inside the Sabbath is the very philosophy. It's like God taking all of his government laws and summing it up in one day. I am resting because all earth is at Sabbath. 
Now, here's something else interesting. Genesis 2, verse 15. When the Bible says here that uh, God Sabbath or God put Adam in the garden to keep it. I want to share with you what that word put means. But before I do that, I want to show you something else. When God gave Adam and Eve the Sabbath, it was a sign that heaven was in harmony. There was no war and there was no, or earth was in harmony. There was no war on earth and there was no rebellion against God. All earth was at peace. God also gave man the Sabbath to keep him from falling under the deception that deceived one third of holy angels. What was the deception that deceived one third of holy angels? Self or, give me another word, self sanctification. You say, how do you get that, Pastor? Notice with me Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. Notice what the Bible says here. Are you there? All right, notice what it says, Ezekiel 12, verse 20. Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. Now let me read that to you with a different emphasis so you can get the picture, okay? Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. You don't sanctify yourself. Don't fall for the same lie that Lucifer deceived one third of angels with that we can sanctify ourselves. I am giving you the Sabbath to know so that you can know that the only way that you can be sanctified is by resting in whatever I tell you. You don't sanctify yourself. Your works don't sanctify you. Your actions don't sanctify you. The only way to sanctification is through rest. Isn't that beautiful? That Sabbath was to serve as a, as, as a, as a fortress, as a protection against the very deception that caused one-third of holy angels to fall. And as long as man remained obedient to the will of God, all earth would remain in peace. I want to read this to you from the Good News Bible. This translation of Genesis 2, verse 15. It says, Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. Guard. What was it that Adam was supposed to, was he supposed to guard the garden from weeds? Was he supposed to, you know, I mean, what was it that he was to guard the garden from? Understand that the garden that God had created, the garden of Eden, by the way, did you know that Eden was in heaven? Remember in Isaiah 14, where it said of Lucifer, uh, uh, you have been in the garden of God, Eden, the garden of God. Beloved, that garden, that Eden, which is another word or which is also translated as paradise, is another term for God's sabbatismos or heaven. Remember Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, today you will be with me in Paradise, the Hebrew of it is Eden. So God had, had an Eden in heaven, and now he takes Eden, which is symbolic of his, his perfect government, and puts it on earth and says, Adam, guard Eden. Because <laughs> I know you guys are following me. 
Guard Eden, Adam. What was he telling him? He wasn't telling him to guard the flowers and the trees. He was telling him to guard the very philosophy of Eden, which was what? Rest. Guard it, Adam, because one is going to come who will try to bring you in a state of unrest. In fact, in that same uh, uh, verse, uh, when the Bible says that the Lord God put the man in the garden, the Hebrew word is nuach. Anybody want to say that word with me? Nuach. Let me tell you what it means. The word means to rest. It is the same word used in Exodus 20, verse 11, which says that God rested on the seventh day. Therefore, God put Adam in the garden, or I like the way that uh, the Young's literal translation puts it, and Jehovah God taketh the man and causeth him to rest in the garden of Eden. Lord have mercy. I guess nobody called that one either. <laughs> God put Adam in the garden and caused him to rest? He put him in the garden and caused him to rest. I mean, as Seventh-day Adventists, you should just be like, just jumping up and down right now. Not that I want you to jump up and down. You should be understanding that this issue of Sabbath goes way deeper than we have first thought. God put him in a garden and caused him to rest. The word means to confederate or to be in allegiance with. So God is basically saying here, Adam, as long as you rest, you, it is a symbol that you are, in conf you are a confederate of mine. You are in allegiance with me. Adam was to guard the state of the garden. To keep, he was to guard the sabbatismos. Keep the peace, Adam. Adam was to be the first peacekeeper. And what happened? The devil came in, came to the garden, and said, uh, Eve, what? You can be like gods. Notice what he said to Eve. The same thing he said in heaven. I will be like God. He didn't come to Eve and say, Eve, I'm Mr. Satan. Would you like to follow me? Would you like to be evil? No. He said, Eve, you can be like God. You don't have to. You can sanctify yourself. You can be righteous yourself without God telling you how. You can know the difference between right and wrong. You can do it, Eve. And Eve eats the fruit. <laughs> and what happens? Adam and Eve, yeah. Adam and Eve, Adam eats as well. Adam and Eve break. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I mean, not that I'm rejoicing, but I'm just glad that you got that. Adam and Eve break the sabbatismos. Earth is now in a state of unrest. This is reflected by Romans chapter 8, verse 7, which says the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not what? Subject. What does the word subject mean? Under. What is the philosophy behind to be subject? It means that I am not resisting, or it means not to be resisting. It means to be what? Resting. The carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it. 
And so man had now received a carnal mind. I want you to fast forward with me just some time to the book of Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 3. How many of you would like to be saved in the last days? <laughs> Please let everyone say amen. amen. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives, which they all chose. Verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. Uh, jump over with me very quickly down to verse, where are we here? Verse 5. The Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil, what? Continually. Now, why did God destroy man? Through the flood? Because man was evil, what? Continually. Now, I want you to notice something here. This word continually actually means every day. <laughs> Man was sinning every day. He didn't even take a break. Okay, let me help you. <laughs> he didn't even take a resting period. He just cut straight through the week. Man was sinning every day, every day, every day. What do you think God is telling us? What do you think God is trying to tell us? That man had no rest. They had no what, everyone? Rest. Now, the Bible says that out of all the people on the earth, Noah found what? Grace in the sight of God. Anyone want to tell me, or anyone know what the name Noah means? Can you imagine that? Noah means rest. Oh, wow. The people, God says, were sinning every day continually, but Noah, or rest, found grace on the side of God. What's the point I'm trying to tell you? Is this. In the last days, there will be people who are sinning every day. But those who find grace will be those who are resting in Jesus. Rest. So, Jesus, the very purpose of the gospel. Who can tell me? <laughs> Does this make you happy as a Seventh-day Adventist? <laughs> Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you alone. Come unto me, all you that what? Labor and are heavy laden. Heavy laden with what? Sin. Labor in what? Sin. What is labor? Give me another word for labor. Works. works. Jesus says the works of the flesh are these. And he begins to list, uh, you know, adultery, fornication, all these things. So he says, come unto me, all you that are working in sin and that are heavy laden with sin, and I will give you rest. I will teach you how to cease. I will teach you how to rest because the only way that you can be saved is through rest. Are you ready for this one? Therefore, the Sabbath is the ultimate sign of rest, not works. Okay, you don't get it. Um, you have been accused as a Seventh-day Adventist of being works 
oriented because you keep the Sabbath. <laughs> Do you see how the devil has flipped that? The Sabbath is the sign of rest. Do you get it? Yeah. It's the sign of rest. It's not the sign of works. The Sabbath is the, the, the sign that I say I cannot sanctify myself by my works. The only way I can be sanctified is by resting in what God says. So if God says it, I rest in it. The devil has flipped the very sign of rest to be the sign of works. You see, what God wants us to understand, beloved, is that we cannot work our way to heaven. We must rest our way. That's what I said when I saw that, too. <laughs> I was happy. Yeah. Rest your way to heaven. We need to understand something else in this context, then, that since the Sabbath is a symbol of resting in God, we can break the Sabbath Whenever, say that word with me, whenever we step out of rest from God. You see, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have fallen for the lie that the Sabbath can only be broken on the seventh day. You're thinking real hard on that one. <laughs> Listen to me. The moment you step out of resting in God, you have already broken the Sabbath. Are you following me? Amen. You see, beloved, we have to understand the Sabbath better than we have understood it. Remember, why did God give the Sabbath? Because the first day was good, the second day was good, the third day was good, the fourth day was good, the fifth and sixth day was good. And then, when it was all good, God said, I give you the Sabbath. What we do, first day of the week, crooked, <laughs> second day of the week, crooked, third day of the week, crooked, Fourth, fifth, sixth day of the week, cursing. And then, oh, it's Sabbath now. Time to go to church. I am keeping the Sabbath. Man, we Seventh-day Adventists, we got it. And we don't realize that in order to get the proper blessing of the Sabbath, we must have lived the entire week resting and submitted in God, then and only then could we truly enjoy the Sabbath, which is simply a symbol that you have been resting, completely resting in him throughout the week. Amen. You see, beloved, we have been presenting, I believe that we have been presenting the Sabbath to our fellow Christians in a way where they're just like, well, man, it's just, what's the big deal about a day? It's just a day. So, anytime we break any of the commandments of God, how many of his commandments? Any. We have already broken the sabbatismos, the Sabbath. The Sabbath is very simple. Do you rest or do you resist? When God says something, do you rest or do you resist? It's that simple. Because if you resist, 
then no matter how much you come to church on Sabbath and you pay your tithes on Sabbath and you dress up on Sabbath, you are not keeping. It's a false sign to you. Do you understand? You have taken a sign. It's almost like, I mean, I hate to use this analogy. Well, I better not use that analogy. You have taken a sign when the reality is not there. Does that make sense? That's what we are doing with the Sabbath. And so, what you and I need to understand is that even the commandments themselves are an amplification of the Sabbath. The, all the Ten Commandments, they are an amplification of what it means to what? To rest in God. You say, how is that, Pastor? Listen to me. Eight out of the Ten Commandments begin with what? I give nobody caught that. Thou shalt what? No. Don't do. Rest. Stop. I'm not asking you to do anything. Just stop. Don't do. God says, I've forgiven you. I've made you righteous. And I say, God, what can I do now to make, to, to, to help? It? I just, just don't. Don't steal. Just rest. Rest from stealing. Rest from lying. Rest from killing. Rest from adultery. That's what he's saying. Just rest. Isn't that? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that's eight out of the ten. And then the other two, what are we thinking of? What are the other two that do not begin with thou shalt not? Honor, Honor thy mother and father. Rest in what your parents say. <laughs> Am I right? Rest. Don't resist your parents. Rest. Be obedient. Be subject to them. Rest. So nine out of the ten, nine out of the ten commandments <laughs> tell us to what? And then remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Say it with me. But the seventh day in this is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Listen to me. In the Ten Commandments, there is not one work. Are you tired? of getting dirt kicked in your face <laughs> by other Christians. Oh, you Adventists, you're all about works. The Ten Commandments, it's all about works. No, beloved, there is not one work in the Ten Commandments. Wow. Wow. You mean I just believe them all along? Well, there are good works. No, beloved, there is not one work. In the Ten Commandments, all the commandments point us to rest. Do you see how the devil has flipped this? And we're fighting on his ground. But it's time for us to take the true rest of God to the earth. And I believe that the sincere Christian will accept the Sabbath when they realize that it is the very foundation 
of rest. It is the very symbol that our lives are submitted to the will of God and we recognize and confess that there is nothing we can do. Lord have mercy. To be saved. Okay, now. Now for the exciting part. I want you to turn with me to Leviticus 25 and verse 4. Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 4. The Bible says here, but in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of, it, of its own accord of thy harvest, thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of the vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. Every six years they were to work the land, but the seventh year was a year of what? Rest. They were not to prune the land. They were not to gather in a harvest. Now, I find this powerfully interesting because what it relates to us, beloved, is that there are, uh, uh, in, the, in the last days when Jesus comes again, Revelation chapter 14, the Bible says he comes on a cloud and he does what? He reaps because the harvest is ripe. And when he reaps, after he reaps, there is 1,000 years where the land is at rest. Therefore, this seven-year cycle very well represents the timing of Jesus' second coming. That seventh year would be a time of rest or Sabbath. And what do we know about Sabbath? When Jesus comes again, what begins? What is he coming? What is he taking us into? His Sabbatismos. He is coming to reap the land and then for 1,000 years, there will be nothing on the earth to reap. The land will be at rest. So, Let me, let me phrase it in a way that will hit you, and then we will explain it. The, what do we call that, by the way, when Jesus comes again? The great what? The great day, not of atonement, the great day <laughs> of, yes, the great the great day of the Lord. My question is, is it possible that the Lord's day is a type of the day of the Lord? Okay, did you follow that? When is the Lord's day? Sabbath. Could it be that the Lord's day is a symbol or a type of the day of the Lord? So I want you to notice with me again, and we're gonna, I'm going to try to do this very quickly. Uh, um, there are how many days in a week? Seven days. And I want you to notice this. I found this quite amazing. Do you know that there are seven major events of Scripture? I mean, like pivotal, uh, like posts in Scripture. Seven major, 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 major events that delineate the, 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 the history of mankind up until the second coming of Christ? What would be the first one? Okay, after creation, what would be the first major significant event that set us off on the path of where we are now? The fall of man. You know what's interesting? When you look at day one in creation, uh, the Bible says there was... Darkness. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. But then God said what? Let there be light. Because at that same time, Jesus comes on the scene and says, I'm going to die for you. Okay? Next major event. The flood. Do you know what happened on day two? The waters... were separated, 
right? Guess what happened during the flood? It was reversed. What will be the next major event of scripture? Think about it. the next catacly, you know, just major, major, major event. Ma We're in Genesis 6 now. What will be the next major? <laughs> the flood. Moses is leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. Egypt. And uh, you remember that as Moses is leading them out of Egypt to the promised land, he stands upon the Red Sea and does what? Lifts his staff and what happens? Anybody want to take a while? Guess what happened on day three? The waters separated and dry land appeared. What will be the next major event after the children of Israel get into Canaan? You know, you got all the... The next major event that comes up on the scene. Jesus Christ, the light of the world. You're not kidding me. Jesus Christ, the Son of the of God. Okay, let's try to put it this way. Anybody want to take a while? Guess what happened on day four of creation? <laughs> That's right. The light of the world. Okay, and so Jesus comes upon the scene, and what will be the next major event, the next major event after the death of Jesus, death and resurrection of Christ? What's the next major event? Pentecost. Very good. Anybody want to take a guess what day five, what happened on day five? God created the birds and the fish. What was Pentecost about? Can anybody help me? The church going out to be fishers of men. Okay, you're good. You're getting this. I like it. What will be the next major event? And, and now I want you to think Adventist with me. 1844, the creation of God's last day man. <laughs> the creation of God's last day people. 1844, on day six, the Bible says God created man, but he also created beasts, and we know that the final events will be the, the man of God versus the beast of prophecy. And then the Sabbath, the second coming. And so, beloved, look where we are in terms of the creation week. It is Friday just before sundown. Amen. The Sabbath is coming. The Sabbath is just before us. And once we begin to understand, beloved, that the Sabbath is coming, the Sabbath is just before us, then we can begin to understand something else very critical for us as Seventh-day Adventists. The Sabbath becomes what I call a weekly fire drill. Is that good? Weekly fire drill. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean, every seventh day, it's like a miniature second coming. You see, we talk about as Adventists on the Sabbath, we're inviting in the presence of the Lord. 
So what I'm saying to you is that what the scripture is trying to say to us is that every seventh day, God has given us a fire drill. He is, he, is, he is trying to train us so that we may be prepared for the second coming. Every seventh day is a fire drill. How do we live throughout the week when we come up on the Sabbath? What condition are we in? That will determine what condition we will be in when Jesus comes again. <laughs> Have you ever had the experience where the sun is setting and you are sweating? I'm not going to rhyme up here, okay? I'm not going to rap. And you are saying to yourself, I'm not ready. Please don't come yet, Sabbath. <laughs> I still have a whole bunch to do. Anybody ever had that experience? Raise your hand, let me see. Wow. Wow, and I'm, I'm raising my hand too. You see, beloved, what God is trying to show us is that in that fire drill, fire drill you know in case of fire because a fire is when jesus comes the fire is coming with him it's a fire drill so when 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 you come upon that sabbath and you find yourself unready what god is trying to show you in his mercy and grace he's week after week he's trying to show you look my son look my daughter you're not ready for me to come you're not ready for me to come and he says look we got another week come on let's get it together Praise the Lord. But he wants us to get it together so that when he comes, we know exactly what to do. That's the purpose of a fire drill. It trains you so that when the real thing happens, you are prepared. You know how to move. You know what to do. You know where to go. That is what Jesus is trying to do. Man, what a wonderful God to give us such a thing. So now you see why the devil would want the world to ignore the fire drill. So that they will be totally unprepared for when Jesus comes again. When the ten virgins, remember the parable of the ten virgins? The five that were wise, what did they enter into? They entered into rest. Why? Because they were prepared. The five foolish virgins were unprepared. God is trying to show us, beloved, that, th that every Sabbath we must be looking and we must be testing ourselves and saying, would I be ready when Jesus comes again? Let me ask you, what is the best time? How is the best way? Why does this happen to us? You want to know why? Because we start to prepare for the Sabbath, <laughs> Friday afternoon, and we begin to try to cram in everything. So we're running, we're sweating. <sighs> no, don't talk to me. I can't. I'm, I'm trying to get ready. Listen to the lesson. Why? Put off for just before Sabbath the things that you could have been doing throughout the week. Think about it. What are Christians, what are, what are many of us doing today? We're hanging out. We're just relaxing. And when we think that we see the Sabbath coming, then we're going to try to start, oh, yeah, okay, I got to get ready now. Okay, I'm going to. And we start trying to get our characters ready. And guess what? There is never 
enough time. When you put off what you could be doing now, waiting for the Sabbath to come, and then you, oh, okay, I've got to get ready now. I've got to do my character now. You will find that there will not be enough time to accomplish the task. Jesus is trying to give us that time when? Now. Now. So the Sabbath is a fire drill. The Sabbath also monitors our would-be disposition in heaven. Here's what I'm telling you. Here's what I mean by that. Every Sabbath day, God, it's as though God is inviting us into his sabbatismos. Okay, did you follow that? Every Sabbath day, it's as though God says, okay, um, this day is kind of like a, um, a drill to see how you would behave if you were in heaven. Ooh. <laughs> so you know what? We come to church. And um, we have uh, attitudes with people. We come to church and there's somebody we're not talking to on Sabbath. You don't want to do that. God, it's as though God is saying, I am giving you six days to get it right with your brother. Six days to get it right, because in heaven, there is no I'm not talking to him. <laughs> so I'm giving you six days. If you knew Jesus was coming back this Friday sundown, what would you do with your enemy? I think we better become friends. <laughs> we would need to put aside all that stuff and say, you know what? The, the most important thing is that you and I must make it into the kingdom of heaven. And beloved, if we would see the importance of the Sabbath and treat it like that, guess what? God really says, don't let the sun set on your wrath. But he's like, okay, you want the sun to set on your wrath? Don't let six days go by. You didn't. Because, beloved, if we carry our burdens, I didn't catch it. You are, thank you. You are working on the Sabbath. I'm going to use that in my next sermon. Don't carry your burdens on the Sabbath. Otherwise, you are working. You are breaking the rest that God is trying to give to you. Not only that, listen to me, beloved. God says on the Sabbath, because Sabbath is a type of heaven, on the Sabbath, I don't want you to sin. That's why the Bible says in Isaiah 56, turn away your foot from doing any evil. Have any of you ever read that? What does any mean? It says, go, it says oh, God is saying, on the Sabbath day, I don't want you to smoke. You got a smoking problem? Don't smoke on the Sabbath. You got a drinking problem? Don't drink on the Sabbath. You got a cursing problem? You got a pornography problem? You got a problem? Don't have that problem on the Sabbath. Rest in me, do not do that thing on the Sabbath. God says the Sabbath is a miniature, it's a snapshot of heaven. Don't do it on the Sabbath because you're not going to be doing it where? In heaven. Now, you might say, okay, well, you know, okay, I can handle the Sabbath. So, I'm going to like you on the Sabbath. Okay, I like you, it's Sabbath. I'm not going to smoke on the Sabbath. I'm not going to drink on the Sabbath. You know what God is really trying to show us? Listen, if you can get the victory on Sabbath, 
<laughs> you see? <laughs> he moves us slowly into, if you can get the victory over Sabbath, why can't you get the victory on any other day of the week? God is trying to sanctify us. He's trying to show us that rest is the key to victory. Isn't that easy? You don't have to do anything for victory. You must rest if you want victory. Rest. And the Sabbath also reveals to us whether we would rather the things of this world than the things of God. What are you talking about, Pastor? Have any of you ever been guilty of looking at the clock? <laughs> when will the Sabbath be over? I got things I need to do. Do you realize what you're asking when you ask when? When you are looking forward to Sabbath being over, You know who was happy when Sabbath was over in heaven? Lucifer. Lucifer. What are you thinking on Sabbath hours? What's going through your mind? God says, I want you to control. I want you to, to, to if things are coming, stop that on the Sabbath. Don't think those kind of thoughts on my Sabbath day because if we were to think them in heaven, we'd be zapped out in an instant. God is trying to train us on how to, Sabbath is how to live in heaven day. Isn't that? It's how to live in heaven day. So you are training, Lord, how do I live in heaven? And he says, okay, I want you to go, you know, you're fellowshipping together. In heaven, it's going to be a big fellowship. You're praising God together. In heaven, there's going to be a big praise. You're, you're doing these things together. You're making peace together. This is what heaven's all about. You're rejoicing to see, to see each other. You're rejoicing to see me. Heaven is a training day, a training day on how to live in heaven. What a blessing the Sabbath is. And then, beloved, we learn that the Sabbath is about full dependence upon God. Do you remember the story of the children of Israel walking through the wilderness and uh, God telling them, hey, I'm going to feed you with what? Manna. You remember that? Do you know that the manna was what kind of a test? A Sabbath test? What was God trying to teach the children of Israel? Rest. Why were they at unrest? Because they were hungry. What are we going to eat? God says, okay, listen, listen. I'm going to rain manna down for you, okay? So just rest. Just relax. Don't what? Worry. Worry. Just rest. What God was trying to teach them was how to rest. Therefore, beloved, we can understand that God wants to teach us on a daily basis how to rest. And he was doing this in order to prepare them for the Sabbath. Okay, did you follow that? He was leading up to the Sabbath, so every day I'm going to give you object lessons on how to rest, how to rest, how to rest, how to rest. Beloved, listen to me. We must learn how to observe the Sabbath, not as one day, but throughout the entire week. Yes, Sabbath culminates on one day. Amen? We come to church on the seventh day, but the principle of the Sabbath permeates throughout the entire week. We learn to rest, learn to rest, learn to rest, and then we, what, what's happening is we're learning to fully depend upon God. Now, not only was God training them how to rest, I want you to notice something else. On the seventh day, God rained down what? No manna. 
He didn't rain down anything. On the sixth day, what did he rain down? A double portion. Listen to this. He rained down a double portion on the sixth day to see if they would be willing to what? Fully rest on the seventh day. Okay, now what happened on the seventh day? What did some people do? They went out looking for what? Looking for manna. And what did they find? None. Listen to me. Many of us as Adventists are coming to church on the seventh day looking for manna. <laughs> We're looking for manna. Why? Because we haven't had any all week. We haven't studied all week. We haven't prayed all week. And we depend upon the pastor to feed us the manna on the seventh day. And we come to church and we leave empty. And we go, man, that pastor. <laughs> or man, that, you know, this church. Beloved, could it be that the reason we are leaving empty is because we're missing the very lessons that God had been trying to give us throughout the week. Could it be that we are being just like those Israelites of old? Okay, I promise you I'm getting ready to wrap this up. I just have a few more points I want to share with you. Listen, the Sabbath is a sign of ministry. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 7, the Bible says here, the Bible says, um, in fact, you read the whole verse, the Bible talks about how we, should, how we should observe the Sabbath, and then it says, you know, isn't this what I've called you to do? To bring the, the naked, what? Into your... Or to bring the hungry, I'm sorry, to clothe the, clothe the naked and bring the hungry into your house. So are you doing this? What verse is it? 58 verse 7. Isn't that what I said? Or did I say, okay, 58, 7. Uh, um, what are we doing? Are, are we bringing the poor into our house? Are we feeding the hungry? And, and the Bible says we're to do this on what day? On the Sabbath day. But you're saying, Pastor, I got a problem because on Sabbath day, I'm at church. <laughs> can, I, can I share something with you? Uh, the naked are those who are not clothed in the righteousness of Christ. The poor are those who don't have the gospel. The hungry are those who are waiting for the word of God. So God says, on the Sabbath day, you, my child, are in my house, which is your house. I want you to bring the poor and naked and blind into your house to feed them and clothe them. This house. This house. I want you to be inviting people into your house on Sabbath. Why? Here's why. <laughs> Uh, here's why. You will not get into heaven if you haven't brought a friend. All right, let me rephrase it. Let me put it this way. Ellen White says, there will be no starless crowns in heaven. If you become a Christian and keep your Christianity to yourself, you are exhibiting the principle of selfishness. Who did you bring with you? Oh, nobody. I'm just glad I got here myself. Woo! 
Every Sabbath, beloved, it's as though we are, we, when we bring a friend, it's as though we have brought someone into the kingdom of heaven. We are rehearsing, we are practicing, and God is saying, every seventh day, when you see the Sabbath as the second coming, it is as though I want you to say, man, who can I bring? It's that kind of an urgency. Just imagine if our church was moved by that kind of an urgency to bring people into the kingdom of God every Sabbathismos. Just imagine what would happen in the church of God. Finally, the Sabbath is the seal of God's government. You know what I, I kind of look and I go, oh boy. You know, in our series we say the Sabbath is the seal of God. Why? Because it has his name, his title, his territory. Proof that the Sabbath is the seal of God. And you know what? I'm not mocking. Yeah, that's true and that's good. But beloved, it goes much deeper. The Sabbath is the seal of God's government because God's government is based upon rest. I mean, all of a sudden now, the seal of God just has so much more significance because it stands for something. It's not just his name, title, territory. It stands for his, the very principle of his government, which is rest. Now, listen to this. How many of you want the seal of God? You know what that means? When the seal of God is placed upon you, it means that you are so rested in God that you cannot be moved. <laughs> so listen now. Guess what the devil tries to do in the final conflict? His only job is to try to move you out of rest. I bet you, God, that if you back up, I'll be able to move him. I'll be able to get them out of rest. I bet you that that seal is simply a sign of something that is not true. God says, listen to me, I put my seal upon these people because they are fully what? Rested in me. You go ahead and try to move them. And the devil's going to come. <clears throat> He's going to try to budge us, move us, and we will be totally rested in God. Beloved, that is what the final conflict is over. Are you so rested in God that you cannot be moved? Let me read two quotes to you. The soul who keeps the Sabbath is stamped with the sign of God's government. And he must not dishonor this sign. By closely examining the word of God, we may know whether we have the king's mark, whether we have been chosen and set apart to honor God. Are you settled or are you movable? Are you so settled that you cannot be changed? That's what the seal is about, something that can't be changed. Are you so settled in God that you cannot be moved? It is the Pledge of Allegiance. Ellen White says again, just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their forehead, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth. <laughs> well, a, a resting, I'm settled. Have you settled? Yeah, I'm fully rested now. Settled. A settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually, so that they cannot be moved just as soon as the people of God are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. On the seventh day, Jesus rested from all his work. I'm talking about the cross. Jesus rested from all his work on the seventh day. Therefore, beloved, 
To reject the seventh day is to reject the cross of Christ. When Jesus was bearing his cross, what was he going to do? He was going to rest. Anyone caught that? He was going to what? To rest. God says, listen, you are broken. I want to fix you. I want to fix you. I want to fix you so that you're no longer broken. Do you know that the way that Jesus has ordained to... How many of you want to be fixed? Anybody want to be fixed in here? So that you're sealed, so that you're settled. Do you know that the way that Jesus has ordained for you to be fixed is through the crucifixion? The word crucifix means to be fixed to a cross. Listen to me. What does that mean? When you are... Somebody says something to you, and normally... But guess what? You have been what? Fixed to the cross. So that you cannot move or be moved. The devil will come. That's what the conflict is about in the last days. Come down from the cross. And by the grace of God, your feet that were once quick to run to evil, your hands that were once quick to evil, your eyes, your tongue, your mind, your body, Everything about you says, no, because I have been fixed to the cross. I am resting as Jesus rested for me. I will not be moved. Beloved, my appeal to you today is that you will not be moved. That you will strive to rest. That you will not seek to work your way to heaven, but to rest your way to heaven. In Nehemiah's day, they had the Sabbath gate, they had the gate open, and on the Sabbath, the gate would close, and it it symbolized that those who refused to honor the Sabbath, were not allowed into the gate. (coughs) Revelation 22 speaks of a gate. Guess what? It is closed to those who refused to rest in God. And that's why Revelation 14 says they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast. You want rest? Heavenly Father, we thank you today for speaking to our hearts. We thank you that you have said to us, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Lord, teach us to rest on your cross. Teach us to rest in your Sabbath. Teach us to rest in you. That whatever you ask of us, we will do. We will rest. Not resist, but rest. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. And in Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen.